scorn, scorn, scorn. Ken Jones against the All Blacks in 1953. Keith Jarrett on debut against England in 1968. Gareth Edwards founding a new religion against Scotland in 1972. The Yian Evans magic trick in 1988. A burst by Scott Gibbs in 1999. Kevin Morgan to put the cream on the Grand Slam cake. Alex Cuthbert's brace against England in 2013. Josh Adams plucking it out of the air in 2019. And now Hannah Jones to usher in a new era in Welsh rugby against Ireland in 2022. Whilst from the outside, two wins over side yet to professionalise might not seem like a sea change, the 2022 Six Nations so far for us marked the start of a revolution that could have huge repercussions on not just this year's World Cup, but the future of Welsh rugby as a whole, as a glorious team of never-say-die professionals begin to capture the public's imagination like never before and create new heroes across the entire land. So, with two wins and a pretty respectable showing against the Red Rose under the belt, how did this Wales team create those moments that have sparked record interest in women's rugby in Wales and what work needs to be done if they start challenging for the top in the coming few years. WE Performance Director Nigel Walker has been quite upfront in the fact he wants to create the best women's programme in the world, but I think the opening win against Ireland was less to do with the impact of the programme's baby steps and more about the belief and confidence the WIU's newfound commitment to their best female players has started to breed in them. Sometimes you can get a vibe off a team that's just going to be their day, and I felt that way with Wales right away during the game in Dublin. This is a short but excellent defensive set from the very start of the game, rushing up and crushing Ireland until they resort to the boot. But it bears uncanny similarity to the start of last year's tournament as Wales held France to account for a few phases until Perrinet goes for a similarly speculative kick. However, the big difference is in what follows. In both cases, Wales concede the first try. But whereas last year, they folded. Straight afterwards, they were giving up easy metres or here only Snowsell is interested in chasing back but even then, she's looking to block Bourgeois getting under the post rather than, you know, attempting a heroic tackle. In 2022, Wales believe. Ireland are on the attack here right after the try, but Wales are prepared. Alex Callender and Cheryl Lillycrap make the double shot, but instead of smashing them backwards, Lillycrap sends an opportunity and lets Callender roll the ball carrier, allowing the captain to get over Wall and with her the ball to win the turnover. Compare the incredible 31-phase goal line stand here to the way Wales crumple in the tackle last year and get caught narrow so easily, barely folding. Belief isn't the most technical point of analysis, but the simple act of knowing somebody upstairs gives a shit feels like the biggest difference for Wales this year. These were always good players and the squad scarcely changed, yet everything about them is different. Belief motivates a team to do the small things. Wales' kick chase last year was abysmal, but contrast the two fullbacks in the opening stages in Dublin. Considine and Powell here each beat the first defender, but whereas Powell finds disjointed green jerseys, Considine is running at a red wall who can easily get to ground. Lillicrap recently cited the Warren Gatland mantra of being the best team in the world at the things that take no talent, and you can see that coming through with this Welsh side. In fact, if anything, they believe in themselves kind of too much. Rona Lloyd's second try for Scotland here coming from Callender celebrating a turnover that, you know, doesn't come instead of playing to the whistle and folding on the rucks to defend the other side, allowing Scotland to catch Wales a woman short and Lloyd to finish brilliantly. But if this try is the cost for a team that now defend as patiently yet aggressively as Wales do, it's worth it. And I'm not to undermine as well how smart they can be. Three months as a professional can't turn an average player into a great one, but it can teach some, you know, very, very good ones a handful of new tricks such as here. With Wales tackling high, Kira Bevan notices and propels herself upwards into Stacey Flood's body to ensure she's upright as possible, hitting her knees to prevent them hitting the ground, hence making sure it's a maul, not a tackle. Flood panics, knowing the turnover is coming, and allows Lake to strip the ball. And whilst I'd wager this tackle technique is something Bevan was taught in the last three months as a pro, especially with her former forwards coach, her boss, on a day-to-day -day basis, this kick is the sort of thing she's been doing all her life, identifying space, and an excellent chase by Newman traps Ireland in their own 22. And they just kept Ireland under that pressure. Here, Ireland set to exit, and Callender reads the play instantly. Knowing exactly how Ireland are about set up, she tells Butchers to just watch the screen setting here, and she lines herself up on the outside of Cronin's boot and can force her to slice the kick. But what took Wales to those two wins is her ability to convert that pressure into points by sticking to the game plan and trusting their teammates. This maul goes pretty well, but with most of the forwards on the floor, watch Jazz Joyce come in on Karis Hale's outside. Last year, Wales lost the shape very easily and didn't really know how to refine it, either just cycling through phases going backwards or kicking entirely aimlessly. Instead, Joyce here makes 
make sure they always have the correct number of bodies about. They're clearly all bought into the game plan of what they're trying to do, and then, as well as pick and drive, Super Jazz makes another super read. Starting to jog around, Joyce is not bothered about being an option this phase. She's thinking of the following play. Powell dummies and goes, and Joyce sprints to now take a position on the far wing. Now, this is in great contrast to Amy Lee Murphy Crow. With Mulhall sucked into the tackle, Constantine here steps in to fill the wing, meaning Murphy Crow should pendulum into the fullback position, filling this space here. However, she checks herself when the tackle is made instead of filling the huge gap on the blind side. Hannah Jones, however, notices it, picks up to play as fast as possible, just watching Joyce again. Snowsill is tempted to arc an open space on the inside, but, but Joyce knows that would allow the inside defence to catch up with her, so she literally pushes Snowsill to straighten, who then times the pass beautifully, brilliantly, while Hall steps in, but Snowsill waits until Constantine looks at her to give the pass, meaning she has to adjust to even scrag Joyce who then, well, this is just world class. She uses that scrag to her advantage. Murphy Crow has finally made it across, but Joyce uses the momentum of her fall to change direction and step inside Murphy Crow for a world class finish. I, I honestly rack my brain to think of whether there are any other wingers worldwide who could pull off this finish. And as I did so, I started to get kind of stuck. There was no way to know whether Damian Penno or Marika Coro and Betty could pull this off because all the clips of them were geo-blocked. So I went to Surfshark. Surfshark is a popular and easy-to-use VPN that allows you to get round the kind of pesky geo-blocking that prevents you seeing whether Cyril Bonet has ever done this playing for Montpellier. And if you're travelling and want to watch the Premier 15s on the iPlayer to know whether Jess Breach has a sinner, you can do that. Hell, I'd have no idea whether Jazz Joyce herself would have scored this because, well, you, you might have noticed watching these, if you want to watch Star Sports outside Australia, Surfshark is your guy. Access to over. 3,200 servers from over 65 countries. You'll never struggle to find out whether Will Jordan could do this again, or whilst utilising military-grade encryption to make sure nobody knows you're secretly looking at Dave Cherry clips at work again as you attempt to establish whether he truly is the best finisher in the world. And, and, you can get 83% off and, and, an extra three months free by using the offer code SQUIDRUGBY at the link in the description. And for my money, which is the money I just saved, Coran Bette is the only guy I feel 100% confident saying would also finish this as well as Jazz Joyce. Coran Bette and Jazz Joyce. This try. Pfft, what a finish. But one guy who requires no such encrypting and hiding would be Wales' new head coach, Johan Cunningham, as he begins to create a team in his own image. Cunningham was incredibly unlucky a few years ago to miss out on the Wales men's forwards coach job after marshalling the Scarlet's pack into league conquering form, but now back in a big way with this Welsh team. Whilst he's big on team culture and positivity, on a more technical level, Johan Cunningham loves nothing more than a bit of niggle. And against England, Wales decided to just abandon everyone else and concentrate double down on that niggle. And it was very effective for about half an hour, up until the horrendous injury to the magnificent Abby Dow, a lady who dares to ask, what if Tim's Visser and Vine were the same person and a qualified engineer? Wales were having huge success by making the game as contestable as possible, attempting to prevent the Red Roses at source. In the previous games, they were happy to sit back and defend in their own 22, but on Saturday, they contest this line out here. Alicia Butcher stealing this time, and then, England's next visit a few minutes later, she disrupts the ball and prevents the dangerous mall from forming. However, in order to keep contestable in open play rather than just set piece, Wales prioritised double tackles. In fact, Jasmine Joyce taking Emily Scarlett's ankles home here as a souvenir is the first time in the entire game a Welsh player makes a tackle alone. And look at the way doubling up regularly caught the Red Roses out and pushed them backwards, hit them behind the game line. It's probably two years since the last saw them hit backwards as often as they were in that first half, with Wales also stripping the ball and forcing knock on several times, as well as allowing the second woman to often enter as a jackaler. However, not only were they fitter when they got into the second half, but the Red Roses also became wise to it as the game went. On. Tailoring set moves to catch Wales backs alone, or here, Scarrett runs a lovely late line. Wales continue to commit to double tackles in the line, banking on both Welsh defenders stepping in on Cornbrook as a done all game, timing this run perfectly to free Kel Dunn on the outside. Wales continue to commit to double tackles on the trial line, but it just means they're committing twice the resources and eventually sees them caught numbers short. Across most of the field, the fullback would sort this out, this would be okay, but this close to the line, it's a try. It's just a sign of where the two teams are at. Wales have reached a point this year, a place where they can get on the same page and execute a game plan that will shut down the majority of the opposition's strengths during any match. But England are so far beyond that, they're now able to learn and adapt on the fly and adopt a plan B 
technique that would absolutely decimate any enemy, even once carefully calibrated to how they play. It's hugely, hugely impressive, but then we kind of knew that already, that, you know, they, they are, they're the best rugby team on the planet. It's something that nobody in the game can replicate at the minute, but I like that Cunningham knows that. Instead of trying to implement an all-round game, the all-court game that the Red Roses have, he's clearly slowly building out Wales' strengths and playing to what he has working at the time. And nothing quite demonstrates his commitment to the consistent, like the remarkable statistic that of Wales' nine tries so far the Six Nations, seven have been scored by front rowers. But these tries aren't just brute force. There's a real technique and shithouse intellect to how Wales approach their tight game. This is the lead up to the Donna Rose try that gave Wales the lead in Dublin. As Butchers drives the line here, watch Bethan Lewis latch on and then work her way around the side. She nudges an Irish arm away from the line and then her bum slides onto the shoulder of Friday preparing to make the tackle. This opens up the space under the Irish captain for Donna Rose to outstretch and score. Now if you want to prove this is a clear tactic rather than just something happened to happen, we can see Rose here herself moments earlier trying to twist her body in exactly the same way to get in Ireland's way so the next carrier, in this case Seanad Harris, can squeeze under the tackler. It doesn't work this time, Wales keep doing this every time they get up to the try line. And indeed they apply the same ideas to the mall. Whilst Carries Phillips' try against Ireland was a simple case of exploding the way Ireland concentrated on the wrong part of the line out, their other tries have been kind of tricks here. Ireland make the same mistake again here, and whilst they quickly adjust, it's not before Harris and Lewis can pinch her in on the first Irish player through, squeezing her out almost as soon as she touches Butchers. And with the Irish pack committing late, it allowed Wales to wheel them round and crab sideways, getting right up to the line. Ireland are then watching Kelsey Jones, the hooker, to break away, but instead it's Donna Rose that spirals off the mall and can crash into Cronin in the fly half to score her first try of the game. Wales actually tried exactly this manoeuvre earlier in the game. It's something right on the edge of the laws. It's a way of trying to get away with a block. It's a semi legal way to do something that is definitely illegal. It's the Rishi Sunak of rugby moves. And whilst the referee is happy with it both times, the TMO notices it whilst checking the grounding the second time to disallow this example here. Here, the pack just smartly twists the English players out of the way, meaning nobody can touch Jones, everybody obstructed, and she waits for the moment Marley Packer enters the mall to break off, knowing she's now one-on-one -on -one with England's smallest player in Mo Hunt. Jones barrels through her to score. They also attempted the same thing against Scotland, isolating scrum off Maxwell here, but Bonnar manages to catch Phillips when she enters in a way Packer didn't quite with Jones. This arsenal of tiny tricks for their forwards are turning Wales into an incredibly clinical team, but they do still have issues with actually getting up to the try line. For how wonderful this Welsh side has been, fly off is kind of turning into a tricky position at the minute for Wales. Ellen Snowsill, an experienced campaigner and pretty much major legend of Welsh rugby, started the first two games and is excellent at marshalling an attack. This passage is fantastic. Snowsill keeps her eye on Higgins here, just daring her to shoot up before timing it gloriously to Higgins' opposite number, put power into space. Snowsill then calls the shape, Butchers and Calendar set, and Wales continue their momentum. Snowsill herself then, here, timing this run extremely well, but Lily Crab isn't quite in a wavelength fast enough because if she's a split second quicker, Snowsill is putting her through for a try. Her game management is also very good. She clearly knows and runs the game plan superbly, inviting carries into space and knowing when to pull the trigger and use the backs, and her knowledge of when to kick is usually pretty spot on. The only issue is her kicking itself. Simply put, Eleanor Snowsill does not have a very very big boot at all. And while she always knows when to kick, she isn't always sure where, and has invited a few opponents onto tasty counter-attacks by just putting the ball into pleasant positions for them this Six Nations. However, when swapped out for the bigger boot of Robin Wilkins, Wales found himself significantly more stagnant in attack. Wilkins is a player who clearly makes a decision on what she's going to do after she's caught the ball, and whilst that can allow for her to exploit space on occasions, in situations such as these it just gave England time to line up and make shots on her forwards. What Cunningham is cultivating is best executed with a strong kicking game, but the attack system he's deploying is endlessly, endlessly more effective with Snowsill. France demonstrated against Scotland that at this level a good kicking game and critically a boot as big as Jesse Tremoulier's, is enough to just pin down a team playing out their skin and beat them with a bonus point. And England's much superior kicking left Wales unable to make anything of the pressure they put on them in that first half. Because Wales do have most of the pieces starting to slot into place, and I think far sooner than we probably expected when those contracts were handed out three months ago. Wales now know a win over an underperforming Italy on the final day should see them finish third which, when you consider how far ahead of the pack England and France have been for a few years now, and the fact they finished dead, dead last, sixth place last year, by a distance, this is a colossal achievement. Hell, after two rounds last year, Wales were yet to score a single point, yet in 2022, they had 10 points from 10 on the table, never mind in the score sheets, as their newfound belief allowed them to create the huge moments in the big games. Fionn Lewis's match winner against Scotland felt like them putting it all together. A superb mall splintered Scotland onto two sides, allowing Kelsey 
Jones to continue advancing right up the middle to eat up the ground. Snowsill then causes shape, and Wales was set, but Jones is flat, static, so Snowsill opts to take it in herself. Butchers then makes a great carry, tying in three Scottish defenders, and Snowsill calls for a carry as a captain absolutely riots onto the ball. This is a brilliant carry by Lily Crap. But, so, we rewind. Malcolm, Belial, and Mattinson combine to make the tackle on Butchers, while Skelton and Gaffney watch the wing. Gaffney drops in the backfield, but none of the forwards notice this, as Belial and Mattinson fold to guard either side of the ruck, following Lillicrap's carry. This leaves Scotland stretched on this side. Malcolm realises Gaffney is missing, so drifts to cover her space. Skeldon notices what Malcolm's doing, so drifts to cover her space. And Butchers notices all of it. So she shows a step her fiancé will be proud of and draws Campbell to put Lewis away for the match-winning try. A whole two minutes earlier than Hannah Jones managed it in such spellbinding fashion a week earlier. If ever there were evidence that these Welsh players were good all along. It was this. There is literally nothing in this try that could have only come from the installation of new coaches, better fitness and conditioning, longer recovery periods. None of those played a factor in this try. It was all about Wales backing themselves in key moments. The Welsh drum is dominant and it allows Harris to catch Ireland off guard with the pick, meaning she can then draw the Irish players tied to the scrum and this means, in turn, if Lewis can fix the fly half, suddenly Wales have an overlap. Wilkins eats up a lot of ground and drifts a tad, but Hannah Jones straightens superbly. Sells the dummy. Constantine turns, dives. She can't make her. Hannah Jones is through. Nobody is going to catch her. From the outside, the start of this year's Six Nations for Wales might have seemed like a surprise, but little else. But for women's rugby in Wales, this was a fuse being lit. The WU showed, for arguably the first time in their history, genuine belief and want to support for this team and it's being rewarded, both on the pitch and off it. And now it's on them, as much as the players, to continue delivering, showing more and more professional progress year on year as we work towards Walker's target of creating the best setup in the world. This is a Welsh team worth buying into, and hence why so many people are doing so. And if we allow them to properly develop as they should, just imagine how many more moments to be passed down through Welsh rugby folklore for the rest of time they can continue to create. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Apologies, it's taken me until round three of the Women's Six Nations to get anything out. I've just had COVID, hence why I didn't finish the uh, Men's Six Nations. Instead, I'm going to do a kind of more detailed video on France and England, kind of go into, you know, a lot of points I wanted to make over the course of the Six Nations that I think I can now do in full detail and do far deeper dives into those that will be coming in the next few weeks, next month or so, over that kind of time period as well as more on the Women's Six Nations. There's plenty of videos out there on the men's, and as I say, I'm going to continue on the women's front, especially the World Cup coming up this year. I want to do far, far more on this. This is all going to be coming very soon. I apologise. I've had COVID. You can also hear my voice a bit in the video, I think. Um, otherwise, so thank you for watching. There's more podcasts out as well. There's a great one on uh, France USA from the 97 World Cup, a game you won't believe actually happened. Um, and loads more, loads more to come. So please, thank you, and... Um, Bye. So I've got a little boy, Jacob, who's nine. He came home the other day saying, Mum, are you a Welsh icon? <laughs> and I was like, I, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. He's like, well, Mably says you are. <laughs> and I was like, well, if that's what people are saying, you go with that. <laughs> that's fine.